Okay, so once again, I do want to welcome you to today's workshop. We are going to be talking about a vitally important skill for today's world, not just in school and in academics, but also a skill that's important just personally. And then also, if you do go out into the workplace, it, it's in a very important skill in the workplace, and that is digital literacy. I do want to introduce myself for those of you who do not know who I am. My name is Sam and I am an academic success coach in the Learning Commons. So I work with students on a variety of academic skills, anything from study strategies to time management. But this semester, I'm focusing a lot on leadership skills, which leads me to my next slide. Um, I am hosting a number of leadership workshops this semester to talk about different leadership success skills, digital literacy being just one of those skills. As you can see, this is the fourth leadership success workshop being offered this semester. And then we have two more coming up at the end of the term next month. Um, the next one will be all about project management. So that could be managing your school projects, but also about some of the project management basics that you could take into the workforce as well. And then at the end of the month um, of November, we'll talk about professionalism and taking initiative. So those are the two upcoming workshops that I have. Of course, today, we're going to go ahead and focus on digital literacy. So before we can really jump into digital literacy and why it's so important and examples of digital literacy, I think it's very important that we go ahead and define digital literacy. So I'm going to give you a moment just to sort of think about, about this. What do you think digital literacy means? Like I said, I'm not going to force you to turn your microphone on. If you have any thoughts about what digital literacy is, you can put that in the chat if you'd like. Um, just go ahead and take a best guess. But if you don't have any guesses, that's all right too. Because I'm going to go ahead and define this by breaking it down into each word. So when I say the word digital, it probably has you thinking about technology. So you're probably thinking about your laptop, you're thinking about your cell phones, you're thinking about social media, video games, online videos. Connor, perfect in the chat, you've said online articles. Perfect. That is exactly what we're talking about here today. So when you're thinking about digital, think, you know, technology, think online, think the internet. But then we want to think about literacy. So literacy, um, if you think of a traditional definition of literacy, you're probably going to think about being able to read or being able to write. And that, like I said, is a traditional definition of literacy. But the way that we think about literacy has changed based off of the wild technological advancements that we have had in the 21st century. And Gabrielle, you said in the chat, knowing how to learn online, that is also a really big piece of digital literacy. Our understanding of literacy has changed leaps and bounds. So there's not just one type of literacy. It's not just learning how to read and write. It is also um, being literate in visuals, in computers, in technology. Um, in just information in general, their civic literacy, financial literacy, um, and then of course, digital literacy. And that is what we're going to focus on here today. So let's go ahead and um, combine those two words together to form a definition for digital literacy. And digital literacy is one's ability to find, to evaluate, and to compose information on digital platforms. And this includes absolutely everything that you can think of that is online. So thinking about those digital texts, so those online articles, 
This could be images, audio, video. Um, it's being able to find these and also to evaluate whether or not they are reliable or have any validity to them. And Gabrielle, you're, you're right. It's exactly knowing how to learn online. It's, um, you know, what is true versus what might not be true. So let's go ahead and talk about sort of how things used to be in the past versus how they currently are. So if we think about the past and the way that we used to treat technology and the way that we used to treat digital literacy, technology was taught as a, a totally separate subject. So for those who, um, you know, there used to be a class for learning how to type, keyboarding class it was called. Um, learning how to type on a computer keyboard. You'd go to that separate area of the school for a half an hour, once a week, and you'd learn how to type on a keyboard. But now, in the present day, it's almost assumed that you know how to do all these things. Technology is such an integral part of all subjects. And so it's just assumed that you know how to perform all of the basic functions of using a computer and all of the basic functions of using the internet. And this is something that has, has really been challenging for many students as we have had to transition all of our classes online. We're finding that this, this knowledge isn't, uh, of course, just you know something that we're born with. It's something that we've had to learn over time and so those struggles do tend to come out when we are forced to use these digital platforms and these digital tools um, especially as we're being forced to this semester so why is digital literacy important so why is this an important that we should all know um, and first is it's important for us to become active instead of passive consumers of digital information. So instead of just taking everything that we see online at face value, it's very important to make good use of your critical thinking skills, but it also allows us to collaborate. So because we are using these digital platforms with you know, the entire world, it allows us to collaborate and build upon information that we can find online or on digital platforms, and then also allows us to um, increase our communication skills. So collaborating and communicating with people we wouldn't have had the chance to communicate with otherwise. But another reason that digital literacy is such an important skill for people today in the 21st century is that individuals who can responsibly use digital tools are more effective and creative problem solvers, which increases your overall efficiency and your overall productivity, not just in school, but in your personal life and then also in your career. So this is a skill that's not just perfect for the classroom, but it's also perfect for just your personal learning. So that growth of your personal knowledge and skills. And then it's also a very, very marketable and employable leadership skill. And that is the reason why we're focusing so much on it today is because it is a, a very marketable leadership skill. I want to talk about a concept called digital natives. And um, if you think of a digital native, this is a person who has grown up in a digital age where there are constantly new technologies to be learned. Um, you know, kids today, and I can say this from experience of having a little sister that is eight years old, that it's almost as if from the time that they, um, they were one or two years old, they know almost instinctively how to use digital tools. It's almost scary um, the way that it, it works today. Um, but some believe that digital natives or these people who have really grown up with technology and using technology constantly think and learn differently than students of the past 
because of their exposure to technology from a young age. And so perhaps the, the ways in which children today learn may be different from the ways in which children 20 or 30 years ago learned. And if you think of um, sort of the opposite or the flip side of this, as being a person that grew up before the digital age and has really had to, in their adulthood, learn how to use new technologies. And you can think of this as a person who would rather read a user manual than look something up very quickly on the internet. So it's almost, you know, on instinct that if you have a question, you can just Google it. But for others, that's not their first thought. Their first thought is, you know, can I, can I check a book out of the library to find out how to do this? Or is there another way? Is there a manual that I can read? Are there instructions somewhere? Their first instinct isn't, all of that information is on the internet. And it's interesting because the researcher who, who really looked into and came up with this term of a digital native, his name is Mark Prensky, and he said that the differences between digital natives and non-digital natives has a big impact on learning, and in particular, online learning. Because not only did he argue that the brains of digital natives have been rewired in some way to learn using digital platforms, he said that the single biggest problem facing education today is that instructors are speaking an outdated language, their pre-digital age language, and that they are struggling to teach a population of students that is speaking an entirely new digital language. And I think that we may find this to be true now that we are, like I said, completely online now. We have um, instructors who perhaps have never taught online before and they're, they're struggling to adapt and learn new tools and technologies that they've never, had, they've never had to experience before. And it is definitely impacting the way in which students are experiencing their classes. And once again, why digital literacy is going to be so important as you advance in your lives and in your careers, whether that is as students or in the workforce. So let's talk about three everyday skills that you can put to use for uh, digital literacy. And the first is to be able to search effectively. So if you think about, you know, just opening up Google and you have a question, you know, you type that into the search bar. How do you, at that point, evaluate the quality, the credibility, and the validity of the information that is found through those search results? Do you always select the top one that is there because it's the most relevant, because it's sponsored? You know, you have to really think about these things before you determine what the true top result is. Um, and I say that because oftentimes you may type in your, your search and the first one at the top is a paid um, result. It's there because the owner of the website paid to be the top result. And so definitely think about these things. Is what I'm reading um, high quality? Is it credible? Is it valid information? Something else that falls into the realm of digital literacy is also giving proper citation and proper credit to sources instead of just copying and pasting. It is very easy on the internet just to find a quote, find um, you know, an article, to find an image, to just control C to copy, control V to paste, and there you go. Um, but it's really something to think about. You want to make sure that you're giving proper credit to your sources when that credit is due. Something else that, you know, is a very simple way to boost your digital literacy is to know how to protect your information online. So, um, you know, I said at the beginning, you don't have to turn your microphones on, but if you want to type in the chat, I have a question for everyone. So who here reads the terms and conditions when they sign up for a website? And you can say yes or no. Does anyone read the terms and conditions? All right, so Ryan says it depends on the site. Okay, 
No, okay. Well, exactly, not really. So I will go ahead and wrap myself out here as well. So in the past, you know, I sort of just click, I agree. You know, you just get through the sign up process, you click, I agree, and there you go. You're now in, you have the access that you were seeking in the first place. Because if you know, if you don't agree, then you don't get the access that, that you're looking for. And so, I, I really, you know, even though I've done it in the past, I've now started to read the terms and conditions because it's, it's really important to understand how our information and how our data is used online and how we can better protect that information. At least if we know that, for example, Facebook is going to own our identity and our information for here on out for the rest of our lives. At least I was informed and I read through it and I knew before agreeing to those terms and conditions. It's also about understanding internet safety basics and also all the different privacy settings that are available to you. And also acknowledging that Obviously, if you're online, you have some sort of digital footprint out there that can be viewed by others and it might remain online forever. So just understanding and acknowledging all of those um, can be a very important factor in being digitally, digitally literate. And there's also this idea of being a good digital citizen. So this is where you are actively, positively, and responsibly engaging in online communities. Um, obviously, if you are online, you could potentially be communicating with people in your local community, but also uh, on a national level as well as a global level. And so it's important that we are not only creating or consuming and sharing valid and credible information, but that we're also taking the time to investigate, um, you know, truly evaluate and make sure that we're learning the, the truth, you know, what's credible and what's valid out there. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of the threats to digital literacy. And this is, is really important as to why um, learning digital literacy is so important. And the first reason is that just due to the rise in, in social media and also the ease of sharing information, you know, at the click of a button, you could share an article, a quote, you know, anything. Um, this obviously has led to an increase in misinformation. And obviously this could be, you know, with malicious intent. So, um, that there is a purposeful reason for that misinformation, or it could simply be um, someone being naive and not realizing what they're spreading is misinformation. It can really go both ways. So let's go ahead and take a look at just um, a simple example right here. If you use Facebook, then you probably recognize the image on the slide. This is a very common copy and paste into your status, but it's this idea that if you post it to your Facebook, then you are, um, you know, saying that Facebook can no longer use your, your pictures, your information, that just simply by posting this to your Facebook that you are no longer, um, you know, your information will no longer be used. It, it talks about finding this information on the news that there is, if you the violation of privacy can be punishable by a law and then, you know, seeming to talk about different statutes and laws. It encourages you to, of course, share it or to copy and paste this into your status. However, this is, is not true. This is misinformation. Um, you know, simply by posting this to your, your Facebook does not mean that Facebook cannot use your information. That is something that you agreed to in the terms and conditions of using the website. And so something as simple as this would be considered misinformation. But also, you know, with the increase of deceptive misinformation, it can be really difficult to really evaluate and determine what is true. So you really want to consider the sources of information. So let's go ahead and take a look at two article headlines. Um, I do want to preface this by saying that I, I wanted to find some silly ones. These are actually from The Onion. So 
you know, not an actual credible news source. These are, are, are made in just fun. But if, if someone were to just share this and not know that it was from The Onion, then they could potentially think that this was real that there was a rare mint condition triceratops skull in Goodwill. You know, perhaps that doesn't really have much of an impact on society and the world, but still not the truth. And then scientists warn Florida will be under six feet of snakes by 2021. So once again, you know, maybe doesn't have much of an impact, but they are, you know, quoting, you know, scientists who are the scientists, you know, why do they say this? Um, and of course, like I said, these are from the onion, so obviously not the truth, but you do want to make sure that you are, you know, verifying and, and finding reliable information. Another threat to digital literacy is that there has also been an increase in photo manipulation. Obviously, there is an entire documentary and TV show about catfishing, different types of fraud, phishing, scams, um, all over the internet, on all digital platforms. And so let's take a look at a type of email that you're probably all familiar with. You've probably received them on your TCC email. You've probably received them on a personal email before, but you know the subject, it seems very urgent, apply now, immediate part-time job opportunity available around your city. Um, it will usually come from someone within your organization or someone that you know in order to seem more reliable or like they're telling the truth. But lo and behold, it's because they fell for the scam themselves, clicked on the link, put in their password, and now their email is, um, you know, can now be taken over by those that sent out the scam email in the first place. So, you really do have to, when you receive emails like this, really truly evaluate, you know, determine whether this is, you know, true, whether this is a scam. Um, obviously, this one here is not, um, not real. So you definitely wouldn't want to click on unknown links. You, uh, and you can really tell for a few reasons. Obviously, the email itself doesn't come across very professionally. Um, but the email itself doesn't make much sense. If someone is approaching you for a job just randomly from a random email address, you may want to uh, take a second look at it before clicking anything or getting in contact with them. And then photo manipulation. You know, sometimes it's, like I said, not malicious. Um, you know, there's not a malicious intent behind misinformation. Sometimes people just try to figure out what they can convince others of. And one of those, this is an example that I found online, that these were flowers that were impacted by, um, you know, by, by nuclear power and that they have grown this way when in reality this is just a manipulated photo. But there's really no harm on the surface of seeing something like this and believing it's true, but in the end, it's just not true. So what can you do on your end to make a difference in um, becoming more digitally literate, in making a difference in the way that you use digital tools and interact online? And first, you know, first and foremost, it is just using your critical thinking skills um, as you are consuming information online. Once again, making sure that you are uh, confirming the validity of information, considering your sources as you are, um, you know, consuming that information, scrolling by, and it can be anywhere and for any reason. You know, personally, just scrolling around, or perhaps you were um, trying to write a paper for class, and so determining what the best sources are to use for that class, it's going to be very important. Remember, and, and we can say this a million times over, just because you saw it or read it on the internet doesn't necessarily mean that it is true. I will also urge you to make sure that you're managing your online identity by evaluating the different privacy settings. And if you've got the time reading the terms and conditions to the websites that you've signed up for, so at least you know how 
your data is being used. At least you could be a more informed user instead of, you know, not really knowing how your data is being used or shared on the internet. An example of this, um, you've probably noticed that within the past few years, you've been asked probably on every website to accept cookies, you know, accept the use of cookies. Well, what does that mean? I'm, I'm sure that many people do know what that means, but I'm sure that there are just as many who don't know what that means and they just go ahead and click the accept cookies button, you know, not really knowing what they're sharing. Um, and then the third here is to avoid plagiarism. So once again, you know, if you are using sources online, if you are sharing information online, if you're creating information online, and you are using the materials or information from someone else, make sure you're giving credit where credit is due. Because part of digital literacy is not just the sharing of information, but also the creation of new information uh, digitally. All right, so I knew this would be a quick one, but I do want to thank you all for coming to um, today's workshop on digital literacy. I know a few of you came in um, a little later, but that is totally fine. If you have any questions, please just let me know. I have put my contact information on the slide here. You are welcome to reach out. And once again, I invite you to my, um, my fifth and sixth leadership success workshops that are going to be in November. Once again, that's gonna be on managing projects. So project management skills, project management basics, as well as how you can use those skills in the classroom. And then also a professionalism and taking initiative workshop at the end of November. Once again, I do wanna thank you and you are free to go. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome.